I think we're ready to go. Are we ready to go, Vicksburg Cultural Arts Center? We are ready. Awesome. Hi, I'm Leanne Seaver, and I am so excited to be with you tonight. We are going to be spending um, the next couple of hours exploring an evening of Venezuelan and American poetry. This is um, uh, the brainchild of the Vicksburg Cultural Arts Center. The destination series um, that tonight focuses on Venezuela was actually begun in 2016 by the VCAC. The goal was to provide an immersive experience in another culture for residents and visitors in Vicksburg so we could experience the visual performance and literary arts, as well as cuisine, storytelling, and history. This program features artists, musicians, authors, poets, all over the world. They're coming to us. Um, used to be in person, but today we're in Zoom. We're trying to get really good at this, but if we miss the mark tonight, thanks for your patience and your tolerance as we try to share the whole world with you through our screens. I would like to um, invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy an evening that's being Facebook Live broadcast on um, a, to get a deeper understanding of not only the people from other cultures, but also of ourselves as we consider our role in the global community. Tonight's destination, Venezuela, culture amidst crisis, um, is part of a weekend of activities that we'll focus on and tell you more about later. Um, but we're going to take a journey inside the history and explore the diversity of Venezuelan arts and culture. And while we're there, we want to gain a greater understanding of the humanitarian crisis that's going on right now and consider our own history in, um, with immigration and equity. Tonight, we're going to start um, that experience with you um, by sharing two amazing, amazing poets, authors, and individuals who will be um, reading for us. Let me set the stage a little bit. Um, there will be pro this performance um, of spoken arts, poetry, is derived from excer excerpts of Florentino and the Devil. That's a heritage poem that was originally Venezuelan, written by Alberto Arveo Taralba. Reading as the Devil, is Timothy Ades. He was a King Scholar at Eton College, winner of the Newcastle Scholarship. He's a member of the Royal Society of Literature and a trustee of Agenda Poetry Magazine. Timothy's awards include the John Dryden Prize and the TLS Premio Valle Inclán Prize. He's gonna be joined by Claudio Mendoza, who will be performing as Florentino. Timothy is talking to us from far, far away, and he'll tell you about that in a minute. But Claudio is actually right here in the studio, appropriately socially distanced from me. He is performing Florentino um, and brings um, all kinds of expertise and, um, and experience to this. He's actually a Venezuelan astrophysicist who's working as an associate research professor at Western Michigan University. He lives in Kalamazoo with his wife, Natalia Critchley. She was a Prairie Rond artist in residence here in Vicksburg last year. And uh, behind me is one of her amazing colorful uh, pieces that um, is being featured here in a newly renovated studio that was once the Doris Lee building here in Vicksburg. And without further ado, I am going to um, turn off mute on my speaker, and I invite all of you watching to do the same thing yeah. and, uh, and close down my video so that you can fully enjoy the and Claudio performing Florentino and the Devil. Good evening. I'm Timothy Addis, a rhyming translator poet in London, England, and I'm honored to open this three-day program. This is the book we are going to read from, Florentino and the Devil. The English words are mine. The Spanish words are by Alberto Arvelo Torrealba. It's a bilingual book. We shall read it only in English. I'll tell you 
the story a little bit. Florentino, who will be uh, spoken by Claudio Mendoza, is the champion singing rhyming poet of the great plains of Venezuela in the state of Barinas. And uh, he's riding out one day across the dry plain. He wants uh, to get a drink. He stops his horse in a little channel of water. He can see the hoofs are in the water. He lets down his drinking horn, pulls it up. There's dripping on the string. But when he tries to drink, there's nothing but sand. There has been a supernatural interference. I've tried to dress up to look, look a little bit more like the devil himself. And so he turns for home. He believes the plane is completely empty, but suddenly behind him, there is a sinister horseman who challenges him to a duel. And he accepts the challenge. And we're going to start with the first words of the duel when the two uh, dueling, uh, rapid rhyming uh, expert poets who are allowed to suddenly change the rhyme and who, who duel by needling and boasting against each other to see who dries up first. And that one will be the loser. So we're in a place where a lot of people have gone to have a drink and a good time. And it's raining very hard. The devil has come into the room. It's completely dry. So they're pretty sure at once who it is. And he addresses Florentino like this. Lily face, jovial Jack. Now, answer me back. What fighting cock takes a trick in the ruck? The cock of the walk, though struck in the beak, he makes a good peck. He makes a good peck. The cock who tracks back and doesn't lash back. Keep his feet, or still better, he pecks the cock feather. He pecks the cock feather. If you're such a know-all, say, what's the republic whose treasure is nobbled without any trouble? Without any trouble, a hive, a papopo's trim trunk of weak timber. Without a machete, bare hands claw the honey. Bare hands claw the honey. You answered that query. For this one, be canny. What quartet of waters all follow one route, are mute if unmet, yet loud in the moot? Yet loud in the moot, Quartrisus quartet, four strings on his heart, a spin with a stone, don't spatters the fret. The ass guy snared, caught out in his guessing, by one who's prepared to play counter-question. To play counter-question. So skillful of speech. Watch out for the fourth. Who quickens his course without whip or spur, on what sires no horse but a mule it may sire? But a mule it may sire. This query's depicting some lad who's street trotting, bareback or on sacking, who quicken his jackass by tickling its carcass on the bite or the sore. On the bite or the sore. The fifth now, be warned of poison-tipped pain. You roamed on the plain with no sun nor moon. Who drinks down the sand in the night's darkest hour? In the night darkest hour, I don't hide my shadow, nor shall it at yours. Unheard by your spear, I fling it back at you. On wandering sands, than waterless dunes, along the sea strands, in seas of the plains. When the very air burns, and the water holds snared, this one who must drink sand, who never drinks water who never drinks water. Don't scupper my send off with chaff in the coffee. A bat is no bird, raw cane is no sugar. If you know, give your answer. If not, then give none, sir. Whose sweet treats the liquor of salt aloe vera? 
Who cools fire too bitter in pools of pure sand? Who's slaked without water in the deep, lonesome land? In the deep, lonesome land, the breast of the dunes is flogged by romance, is startled by thunder, is crossed by a soul, is swallowed by fumes, is stripped by the blast, is sacked by the blast, is racked by the dirge, is charged by the flame, is watched by the palm, is lit by the star, is seated by hope, is fertile with pain. Sirs, shall I be blamed if the seeker shall find me? If the seeker shall find me, then fear cracks him open in midnight small hours when candle flames gutter and after fierce showers the branches drip drooping when woebegone spectres straveying the savannah when plover sings shrill, guacaba sings shriller. Deep sea is my breathing, flood tide is my roaring. That's when Florentino is silenced and failing, when Guan bird cries ruin, when rooster cries mourning. Now we'll, we're going to do three little excerpts. That was the first. We'll come on to the second. And in this one, the translator, that's myself, managed a passage with a repeated word uh, syllable ning every two lines and still I think matching the Spanish. So we've been talking about water and the devil says on the breast of the pool I noticed your skill I knew you'd be fearless a corsair around my vessel's brave sailors a man of command good wine a good woman by fate you are crowned with the laurel of failures. With the laurel of failures at night when I say my old childhood prayers. Up fly the Hail Marys with heralds amen to thwart one who traces the cross on the water and thirsts until then. And thirsts until then. That bird who goes begging, I hope it gets nothing like me when the maize gives me cobs without corn like me at the river no draught ever drawn i swerve with the smoke like tinsel of tinning i take a new track can you go where i'm turning now sirs you will see can you go where i'm turning if you chose a clarinet sir don't give me bassooning don't clank your brass platters like an ox cart rough running. Some rhymes are not coming when garlic nicks skinning. Bill clappers and happy when ringers hang clowning. Art, even in heaven, is all disciplining. Our canyons sing flat when conductors gone swanning. Conductor's gone swanning. File a hoof, love a loofer, he's musing on punning. For the downbeat, despondent, dung beetles his kenning. The viscounts and eyes squint, trap scallions the cunning. I've crumpled thick parchments of legal unmeaning. I'm spruce, yet respect others patching and darning. When I sing with a man, my top note sets him churning. By boldness I shake him, by wizardry winning. I crush, but don't shame him. I trounce without spurning. I trounce without spurning. I shun Chinese burning. Not whining, nor fawning. If I don't shoot the tiger, he'll eat me, no warning. No cuff in the offing, and bash meat for dining. Sir, if you molest me with summary dining, what good to protest if my backlash is stunning? I sign on the line, the same as your signing, to tassel head on, head on I'm sustaining. Black vultures of clay mire, of corgut deep downing. Meet the cheat, the purveyor of beef that was brining. Now, sirs, you shall see the evil ones straining. 
the evil one straining. Don't fib, you don't know me. Don't fake your buffooning as I carve with my blade. No pretense of no paining. This land I have learned by frequent returning. These gentlemen know my sharp nails campaigning, dispersing the gathered, the scattered convening, dissolving the clotted. I clot the free running. I suck little limes, every bitter bit draining. Every bitter bit draining. You raise your crest high, which I soon shall be downing. No worries, my friends, he's mine for the pruning. Let him be in his boat for raining or drowning. Let him set up his show, which I'll be detuning. Let him hope for good cards, I'll be dealing and dunning. Let him dig in his claws, I'll unfasten his spinning. Let him raise up his head, he shall slink out resigning. One who brought him shall lead before God's own good morning. He'll trail the fine steed like an ass of low cunning. Can a vulture compete with a chieftain's fine tuning? When the great lantern forms go twist at day's coming, if he alter my rhymes, I can alter his rhyming. Now we go to the final section, which brings us all the way to the end. Again, we're talking of water and rivers. The river sends eddies right under your roof. The waters are closing. Sigh, death's last farewell. Goodbye to the light. Take thought as you sigh. Malice groans in the murk. Who lights the dread dark? Take leave of your love. Reflect as you sigh. On your harp of delusion, who sounds the deep cry? Take leave of your faith. Take thought as you sigh. If sorrow's the truth, is it evil to lie? Take leave of the hours. Recall as you sigh. He who strove to endure shall have strife evermore. Take leave of the cross. Never think of the sigh. Never think of the sigh. Come save me. A lady of solitude, lady of Carmel, blessed lady of El Real, lady of Saka, sweet lady of peace, serene lady of Lourdes, your fountain for an altar, a lady of Coromoto, a lady of Chiquinquira, your face carved in cedar's rough bark, pious lady of the Vale. Saintly lady of the pillar, stone miracle, streams holy patron, with God's aid, a lady, faithful mother of sorrows, grant me your bright splendor, your shield and your sword, Saint Michael defender, blessed child of Atocha, O oh, most holy trinity. The music has ceased. The black boat departs. Sirs, your health. The dawn drinks in the pass of the king. Distant echoes repeat, O oh, most holy trinity. Thank you, Timothy. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was amazing. And it's going to be followed by the amazing Venezuelan poet, Sara Lupita Oliveres. American poet. She's American. Okay. Like, I'm definitely not Venezuelan. <laughs> <laughs> okay. She's American. Thank you. Sarah Lupita Oliveras is the author of Migratory Sound, which was selected as the winner of the 2020 Cato Canto Mundo Poetry Prize and is forthcoming from the University of Arkansas Press and of the chapbook Field Things from Dancing Girl Press. Her poems have appeared in Gulf Coast, 
Denver Quarterly, Salt Hill Journal, Diagram, Jubilat, The Cincinnati Review, and others. She earned her PhD from Western Michigan University and currently lives in New Mexico, where she works as an assistant professor of English at New Mexico Highlands University. Sarah went to Vicksburg Middle School and graduated from Matawan High School. And we are delighted that she is with us virtually tonight. And I would love to turn this over to Sarah. Thank you. Um, yeah, I was, I was um, born in Vicksburg. I, I think downtown in Kalamazoo, but my, um, when I was born, I lived in um, a little blue house on Prairie, I think like down, kind of down the street from where you are. Um, and I had told Claudio and said that when I was little in that building that you all are in um, is where I would go see the Easter Bunny and get jelly beans when I was little um, because my aunt's neighbor owned it. So it was like a little, little gift shop. So um, yeah, so I, I've been really excited to be able to read here and um, and I'm really glad that it, the event was postponed and rescheduled. So I am glad to be here. Um, so I'm going to read from my book, Migratory Sound. It did actually come in the mail today. So I have, I have one of them. Um, and I think that this, I'm not gonna read out of it though because I think I'll get confused because I don't know it just yet. So I'm still gonna follow my, my poems that I have here. Um, but I think that this collection explores my own sense of movement. I wrote some of it while I was living in Texas for a bit, and then some of it when I was living in Brooklyn. And then when I returned to Michigan for my PhD, then I wrote the poems that kind of finished the manuscript. So um, movement is important. And when I came back, I was drawn to exploring um, my dad's side of the family of um, their history of immigrating from Mexico to Texas up to Michigan for seasonal work in the fields and factory labor. Um, and my mom and dad both worked at, it was Upjohn at the time, so Pfizer. Um, and when I returned to Michigan, I think in my, in my memory, um, Michigan was like all trees and all natural spaces. And then when I, when I came back then I started to notice um, just the prevalence of the factories and so just seeing the smokestacks throughout the trees everywhere and these divisions of place so I became interested in the pastoral so um, the sense of leaving and return and what exists outside of these enclosed spaces um, and what it meant within these sort of generational implications and in bringing my daughter to Michigan and um, and I think in ways I, I, I establish a sort of like um, new perspective of, of Southwest Michigan and returning. So um, I think a lot of the poems are informed by that. Okay, so I will read the first poem that's in the book, Night. Before lost, there is habit, the moon implied beyond a fence. Outside a goat crosses the pavement, hoof circle in the snow, a broken jaw reassembled. I began to make a house despite the highway. What song into the child's ear subtracts an animal's forage end to end. The wrong leaves have been eaten. Each absent correspondence bleats. You misinterpret the animal's mouth as objectivity, each unparticular way of seeing. Um, so I think with some of the poems in this book, I, I was really drawn to looking at different depictions of animals and um, and how, how we might try to translate or convey a physical form and um, I think kind of like what is lost in that, that sense of translation. Drawings of a red-billed pigeon. You can see only the shape of the red-billed pigeon in the bathroom window. Opaqueness, a distance, the yard repeats. The moon sinks, its persistence a syllable swelling through the day. A child draws worry as a river, its stones neatly pressed to one side. 
When we take a photograph of the landscape, we find ghosts of trees in ways dimming around themselves to create indentations of other selves. I come home and empty out someone else's drawers. The blurriness of trees deepens, though the periphery remains pointed as if to highlight. Interiority being a complicated resolve. The red-billed pigeon halfway hatched from its egg, its shell a root taken from a landscape and turned upside down, our own want left to unplace its things within idled forms. You can hear a singing still before opening, the self quietly separated from its own sound. Anne Amelia on Stasis. The figure of an animal does not pose. In its flux, it is drawn in silhouette, seen anatomical with loss of color, light, and movement. Two peacocks facing away from one another, drawn without feathers as dead sparrows, their similarities and differences meaning nothing, context worn away. When drawing the anatomy of a female, da Vinci often used animals, the uterus of a horse or bear, the oddly shaped light. To create an illusion, the animal must remain anonymous. In the field, there is another field chewed down until motionless. How the private disfigures the external. Through distance, a quiet hysteria becomes illogic. Um, so this next poem is a gazel, and this form is defined by its use of couplets, so two lines, and um, then each, each couplet is supposed to be its own separate entity. So I think that this form sort of allows you to start, start new each, um, each stanza, but there's a sort of like strange associative quality that I think happens, um, when you're not, you're not necessarily thinking about where the poem should go, but it starts to kind of like collect and, um, accumulate throughout. Um, and I also have to say my name at the end, so that's, um, that's why I say that, so. Glimpse. It takes nothing, the many flowers beheaded, the grass empty and uninhabited. Transplanted, the roots hang anonymous and empty. The letter begins in feigned humility. A wheel without spokes radiates. The unseen value of timid sound, its response empty. In the drawings of seas and mountains, a doe's spotted back camouflaged, the sea nearly uprooted, where rocks emerge and empty. Sometimes a person posed in a garden, the portrait peers back, in others the flowers are cut, placed in a vase, this movement empty. The public and private conflated in a dream sequence, the sinew of my own intrusion, we find the map named scribbled, following empty. There is a complete list, and I wonder what occurs when order disappears out of forgetfulness or in being diminished by wear, intention then empty. Surrender or lack of will in nature becomes unnoticeable in its disorder. A perfectly intact bird dead under the dogwood, its shadow cast empty. When bending the neck to drink from the river, when tilting the head back or forward to sleep, the invisible navigation embedded followed empty. It is not a mistake when the rustling quiets and then stops. The animal remains hidden, lupita meaning little wolf, one's own habitat empty. Um, okay, and this next poem is a sonnet. Um, so it has a turn that happens. Um, and I think that this poem sort of explores a sense of returning back to Michigan and being interested in exploring the factories and um, also talking, like, talking to my family and, um, yeah, okay, circuit. Somewhere a bow shadow contradicts its shape. Any instance and the ghost will unhinge its loneliness where it recognizes its past. In one version, the pasture is a complicated tradition where moss gathers on the roof, the mind sees a plane. In another version, the pasture feels the doe's teeth 
in a forethought that many flowers give, where the seen and implied become patterned, another's currency is abstraction, Victor's hand cut off in a machine at the paper mill, each morning the sulfuric air, my inheritance is a dialogue of transgressions, the sound and shape of the landscape omitted. Um, so that poem, again, kind of explores me, like knowing that I had an uncle that um, lost his arm, but not knowing how it had happened. Um, and yeah, and I think with things like that, you're kind of afraid to ask the person or you're afraid to talk about it. So um, I think a lot of the, a lot of this manuscript explores that sense of like secrecy and um, the audible and inaudible that exists within place and landscapes and things. Um, and so it was when, when I moved back that then I found out that it was a factory accident, um, but still figuring out um, how the narrative is disjointed, you know, um, through time and all of those things. So, of small spaces, glass eye of a crow, salt grasses wave by, to instead remain lost. What washes up explains survival. A note removed from the forest, empty elsewhere, smokestacks over town, movement as a means of obscuring, white field of roses, children in a line, how forage diminishes form as observer, the crow avoids its dead, rerouting paths of hunger in avoidance, again and again held in place, even when remaining still. Two more. On balance. After blooming, the cactus shrivels incrementally. Driving away an ox, its horns crooked. Blame grows small in the moths circling. Day to day, the slightest tooth loosens. A landscape changes until returning by habit. The child's sound without concept repeats. Where intention collects a sparrow lost in topiary. And then the last poem, Clarities. Under the moon, a tide, fish eggs hatch in the reeds. A stone is broken open and reveals no gleam. Out of a conversation, three small accusations. While the plum skin falls, the flies pause and watch. A motionless lake, the moored bottom shifts. Through hierarchy, a sound quiets. Where leaves blow open the wet dirt, a landscape without concurrence. Having watched, the animal too buries its dead. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. I am looking forward to hearing more from you, Sarah. And I'm so grateful for your sharing of your work. Also to um, Timothy and Claudio, thank you so very much. We have um, also an amazing opportunity tonight to enjoy the work of some of our lo local artists, um, our local poets, because tonight we are going to um, share with you the work of some of our Tournament of Writers winners. So we have um, with great uh, pride, several of them will be participating and a few who can't participate, um, but have allowed us to share the work that they submitted that won in specific categories. Um, I, I love the, uh, the verse poetry that you shared, Sarah, and um, that Claudio and Timothy um, shared with us. It kind of sets the stage for our own uh, winner in the adult category for poetry, our own Krista Ragazzi, who wrote an Aintu, and Aintu is an African verse poem that um, the, the phrase actually roughly translates to pearls of wisdom, and they are miraculously contained in 32 syllables. So um, 
Uh, Krista is getting ready to share that with you. And I'm going to tell you this much about her. She is a transplant to Kalamazoo, um, but is our own art teacher at Vicksburg High School. And um, she finds joy in this community and in the arts in general. Krista met a group of women who are now her treasured friends. Um, they all began the Lake Effect Writers Guild back in 2012. And she loves writing in addition to her art, um, other forms of her art. Um, and she also loves her students, music, snow days, and anything with cheese. I hope you're laughing out there. I thought that was adorable. Um, Krista has been married to Steve Rigazzi for 31 years, and she's incredibly proud of her three children and her new son-in-law. And without further ado, I would like to um, invite Krista to read Vintage Wallpaper and Eintu. Thank you, Leanne. Passe Robin Egg Blue with Oriental Blooms, gilded figures and white rabbits listened and watched for years, hung quietly judging. Wow. Thank you, Krista. Thanks. The whole time you were reading, I was looking for my mute button. <laughs> <laughs> so you, well, you were pretty so quiet. <laughs> I hope that wasn't too distracting. No, not at all. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Krista. Thanks. Lovely. Um, so uh, uh, we have um, our second place winner in the poetry mm -hmm. division for adults. He is Mark Stuckey, and he's going to be sharing with us Consider the Dreaming Birds. Let me tell you a little bit about him. Mark is from Portage and he works as a senior technical writer for KMC Controls. He's also written articles, stories, and poems on a variety of topics, um, including spirituality, cinema, computers, communications, and science fiction. He's received over three dozen writing and publication awards and we are absolutely thrilled that um, he submitted to this contest. And uh, we hand this over to you now, Mark. Um, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me here. I'm also a transplant to the Kalamazoo area as of 2014. Um, it is an honor to join you to read a poem that I wrote at the end of last year during the Christmas season. You will hear a Christmas theme at the end, but my poem was inspired by the, the two pet parakeets, also known as budgerigars or budgies that I once had. They would sleep in very strange positions, something like in the photo I will show you in a, mo in a moment. Consider the dreaming birds. Jesus told us to consider the birds of the air. I have pondered parakeets, budgies, in a cage, routinely performing what seems impossible. No, not flying. They fly rather poorly. It's the posture they keep as they sleep. Usually before closing their eyes, they puff out their colorful feathers, precariously balance on just one slender leg, twist their heads halfway around, and nestle their beaks under the backs of their wings. How can they do that? Why would they want to? No human can hold such an improbable pose, not even in yoga, let alone while dreaming. I've puzzled over those tiny, amazing acts that birds do daily with little thought and no explanation of their motives to me. Although I can't replicate their strange stance, to those tiny birds, I am godlike. They periodically chirp loud petitionary prayers for me to give them this day their daily bird seed. But omnipotent and omniscient, I'm clearly not. Those winged, unlikely wonders mystify me. Perhaps if I could enter their caged existence and take on the feathered form of a fellow bird, they would softly warble their secrets to me and I to them. 
I treasure miniature miracles in implausible places. And if a fluff of feathers can perform such wonders, surely the God of the universe can go bigger and better, can fling a star-like light across Bethlehem's sky, can create conception in a virgin by divine in vitro, can take on flesh in our own featherless form, and can croon to us heavenly dreams. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. We have a couple of entries that um, have come in to us um, in other divisions. Neither of those winners could be with us tonight, but the Vicksburg Cultural Arts Center has um, come to the rescue. And one of their board members, well known to this community, um, Jake Munson, is going to read a couple of those entries. The first one is um, called Morning Rain by Rebecca Penning. The second place winner in the young adult division category um, is Grace Flanagan. And Jake will be reading both Rebecca's poem, Morning Rain, and Grace Flanagan's poem, Forest So Serene. And now through a miracle of technology, we shift to Jake. Hi. All right. Rebecca Penning's poem, Morning Rain. Awakened, laying in silence, the sound of morning rain beats against my window pane. I listen quietly, I listen. Shh. Drip, drop, drop, drip. The smell of morning dew, freshly intoxicating. My soul feels cleansed, awakened. Breath as I breathe. All my senses become renewed to the sound of morning rain. Time stands still with a newness in the air. I have made this moment in time all mine. Reflection. Each drop is my inner music as it falls methodically into my own soothing rhythm. Allow your mind to be quiet. Just listen. Morning rain. and A Forest So Serene by Grace Flanagan. Wandering wistfully over worn path, I stumbled upon a forest so serene. Journey through barren realms, or driving river muted elms, found me not what I sought, but here my Camelot. Velvety moss soothed my feet, resplendent meadow sweet, soft murmur of warbler wings and gentle violets awakenings. Whispering brook ran through, blooming trillium new, bits of white and green, rabbit ears velveteen. Golden leaves trembled in the air and silence hung like a prayer. Lifting mind to higher thoughts, I knew I found the place I sought, independent of ideals mean, distant from society daft the quiet path. <clears throat> Thank you, Rebecca and Grace for being part of that uh, competition and Krista and Mark. Um, I have the uh, privilege of reading for you now a poem by Robin James called Ode to Democracy, Long Live the Kings. Thanks, Jake. Welcome. Put his mask right back on. <laughs> Ode to Democracy, Long Live the Kings. Pictures of my country's heroes who fought wars with bows and arrows stare bewilderingly out of my television screen at me, barely noticing, I wonder, what of these men's lives and plunder carries on in Bel Air mansions owned by a modern bourgeoisie? Progeny of staunches valor has inbreeding caused this pallor of the children of the children of the men who won our wars. And I wonder why continue as if by right of bone and sinew to exalt a monarchy of multinational corporate whores. Yawning over lost compassion, bored by every living passion, scoffing 
at the former generation's acts of charity. The heir to our American legends bears no honorable mention when around the blazing trash we talk sons of liberty. And the nouveau riche of Asia proudly flaunting their aphasia to the blood and sweat of peasants dying on their factory floors prop up despots and dictators in nations south of the equator, indifferent to the cries for freedom heard outside their palace doors. And as the working man grows poor, his rich master cries the horror. You'd be fine if only there was racial, no racial equality. If the man's the other color who has caused your growing dollar, hate him, for your problem really has nothing to do with me. And while we have listened to him, spitting with increasing venom at our blameless brothers and sisters suffering just like us and more, the richest men are growing richer. And the middle class indentured to the servitude of product purchases they have just made before. While we are all working harder, kings engage in acts of barter, deliberately provoking an unfathomable brutality in sacred lands and sovereign nations, scattering a paltry ration of rights ensured by ancient constitutionality. Like the cattle to the slaughter, we will send our son and daughter off to fight for freedom on a foreign and oppressive shore. And when our children ask us why, we reiterate the lie, as has done every generation that has ever come before. And pictures of my country's heroes who fought their wars with bows and arrows look at us with a hollow stare of an unbroken banality. All our leaders now have died, and with no one left to guide, blindly we take on the yoke of slaves that once fought that they once fought to free, our freedom pawned for merchandise in the name of democracy. Robin James wrote that poem in 1998. A moment to take this all on board, the power of these words and the way it makes you feel when you hear them. All of them from rain to democracy to Venezuela, to an Ein Tu. Thank you all poets for sharing that with us. I want to transition now to <clears throat> final readings from the work of Rafael Cadenas. First, Timothy Ades will read Defeat, and then Claudio Mendoza is reading Making Peace. Let's go back to Venezuela with them. Okay, back to Venezuela. Two poems by Rafael Cadenas, who is a very senior, very distinguished poet in that country. And we'll be reading them in English as translated by Professor Rowena Hill. Defeat. I, who have never had a trade, who before any competitor have felt weak, who have lost the best qualifications for life, who as soon as I arrive at a place already want to leave, thinking that moving is a solution, who have been denied in advance and scoffed at by the more fit, who lean on walls so as not to fall down, who am an object of laughter to myself, who believed my father was eternal, who have been humiliated by professors of literature who asked one day what I could do to help, and the answer was a guffaw, who will never be able to set up a home, nor be brilliant, nor triumph in life, who have been deserted by many people because I hardly speak, who am ashamed of acts I didn't commit, who have nearly started running down the street, who have lost a center I never had, who have become a laughing stock for many, because I live in limbo, who will never find anyone to put up with me, who has passed over in favor of people more wretched than me, who will go on like this all my life and next year will be derided many times more in my ridiculous ambition, who am retired, who am tired of receiving advice from others more lethargic than me, 
you're very slow, get a move on, wake up, who will never be able to travel to India, who have received favors without giving anything in return, who go from one side of the city to another like a feather, who let others sway me, who have no personality and don't want one, who keep a lid all day on my rebellion, who haven't gone to join the guerrillas, who have done nothing for my people, who don't belong to the FALN, and despair over all these things and others it would take forever to enumerate, who can't get out of my prison, who have been discharged everywhere because I'm useless, who in reality haven't succeeded in getting married or going to Paris or having one serene day, who refuse to recognize facts, who always slobber over my story, who was born an imbecile and worse than an imbecile, who lost the thread of the argument that was being worked out in me and haven't been able to find it again, who don't cry when I feel like it, who arrive late for everything, who have been ruined by all those marches and counter-marches, who long for perfect immobility and impeccable haste, who am not what I am, nor what I'm not, who in spite of all am satanically proud, though at certain times I've been humble enough to match stones, who have lived 15 years in the same circle, who thought I was predestined for something unusual and have achieved nothing, who will never wear a tie, who can't find my body, who have perceived my falsity in flashes and haven't been able to knock myself down, sweep all away and create from my indolence, my floating and my straying a new freshness and obstinately commit suicide within hand's reach. I will pick myself up more ridiculous than ever to go on mocking others and myself till judgment day. Making peace. Let's come to an agreement, poem. I won't force you to say what you don't want and you won't be so reluctant to do what I wish. We wrestle a lot. Why are you so determined to be my likeness when you know things I don't even suspect? Free yourself from me. Run and don't look back. Escape before it's too late because you always outdo me. You know how to say what drives you and I don't because you are more than yourself, and I am only the man who tries to recognize himself in you. I take up the space of my desire, and you have none. You only advance towards your destination without looking at the hand you move. That thinks it owns you when it feels you sprout there like a substance that stands up. Force the writer to go in your direction. He only knows how to hide. Cover up what's new. Become poor. What he shows is a tired repetition. Poem, keep me away from you. Wow. Here's my favorite line in that poem. You are more than yourself, and I'm only the man trying to recognize myself in you. It just, it just um, um, very, very well reads me. Uh, what we're trying to do with the Destination series. And um, I want to thank all of the readers and writers and poets who participated today. Um, it, this is not the end of our visit to Venezuela. We have things going on the rest of the weekend and, and more. Um, we have 
uh, exhibits on Sunday. And we have um, beginning at noon, a number of things that will be going on, <clears throat> including a food truck at 106 Main Street. Uh, Same Arepas is going to be featuring Venezuelan cuisine, including even gluten-free and vegan offerings. Um, David Cuero will be the chef who brings this to us, and it's going to be um, a really good day to come down to Vicksburg and check out some Venezuelan cuisine. I hope that you all can do that, who are within driving distance for us. Um, we also have um, exhib the exhibitions that will be open from noon until 8 p.m. in um, our exhibition center here at 101 Prairie, am I right? There, there's four locations. There's four locations, actually. You're not going to remember what I say, even if I say it. So here's the cheat sheet. Just go to VicksburgArts.com and all the information that you seek about where you should be this weekend and for the rest of our Venezuelan exhibit will be available to you. Uh, it's going to be an, an amazing thing to experience that in our own little community. There people want, that want to ask questions. Yep, we're gonna, we're gonna come back to the a Q and A. Um, one of the things that's gonna be really special about the exhibit is the chalk walk. So this would be a cool time to come down even with the younger demographic. Um, we're gonna be providing chalk and ideas and lots of appropriate social distancing for creating art on the sidewalk space here in Vicksburg. So by all means, come and join in that activity. Um, that will be on Sunday, again, uh, from 12 until 8, this DIY up art project. The materials, the design ideas, and your own space are waiting for you. Please come down and, and join in on that. And next Saturday, um, we have an amazing panel discussion opportunity that um, will feature four renowned scholars and journalists who will be focusing on what's happening in Venezuela right now with the Q&A. So um, on that note, um, we have some Q&A that we can open ourselves up to right now for a few minutes. Thanks for um, joining in the chat. There's a couple of um, questions. Christina Powers. Christina Powers. We are open to questions from you. Feel free to turn on your mic. Anybody okay. who's not starting with me will turn ours off to let you speak. Christina. All right, we'll, we'll see if this works. Um, particular to, uh, particularly to Messrs. Um, Mendoza and Addis, when a poem is written in a particular language and then it's translated, that has to change a, a lot of the emotion. And how difficult is that then for the translator to um, create the mood, create the original emotion and passion of the, uh, of the poem bringing it into a second or multiple languages? Well, uh, I, I'm the one who is a translator. I've translated about a thousand poems from different languages. And I think the answer is that I, I, I let the poem wash over me and I think in English and I hope the words miraculously come to me. Uh, so I don't know if it's difficult. Uh, people often tell me it's difficult and must be difficult, to which I say, well, I happen to have the knack of it. I'm lucky. I, what I find difficult is cooking or, or uh, growing plants <laughs> in the garden. Uh, so, and, uh, you know, the ancient Greeks and Romans believed these words came from the muse. And that, that I find is as good an explanation as any. I would like to add something to Timothy's uh, ideas. It, the poem of Florentino al Diablo has got many dimensions. I mean, the, the usual one, we, I think most people was, were expecting is, you know, the harp, the cuatro, and the maracas, and the two guys singing, trying to beat each other. <laughs> 
But the, the point goes, you know, much further. For instance, a, a very well-known Venezuelan composer, and Antonio Esteves, he created a, 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 an orchestra score for this poem called, uh, 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 what's, what's the name? It's, uh, Cantata Criolla, a full score. So it, it has different dimensions. And the one we're taking here is one that would allow us to share with people in the U.S., in, 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 in the town of Vicksburg, the essence of the poem. I mean, we haven't put the, the, the music because we thought that the poem is strong enough to be able to you know, convey its meaning. And I think that was the idea that we, that we talked about when we had this idea. Yes, and uh, Estevez wrote it for a classical orchestra, but it's much more usual and typical, I think, for it to be sung by great Venezuelan folk singers. And you can find several versions on YouTube if you key it in in Spanish, Florentino y el Diablo. If you key it in in English, you'll get me and my friend doing <laughs> excerpts rather like we've been doing today. Uh, so there are those two ways of experiencing it. And in fact, uh, the music is, it makes it more exciting and there are visuals on those other um, uh, videos on YouTube, which also convey the, the scenery and the nature and the beauty of Venezuela. And this poem mentions many of the wonderful flowers and trees and birds, which, uh, which to me in England anyway, are completely astonishing and magically beautiful. And they are a feature of the poem. Well, thank you so much, both of you, for the, for the uh, translation and for the presentation and for the experience. It's been a, a wonderful way to spend a Friday evening. It has. Have a question for Sarah Olivares. Sarah, do you have a uh, writing regimen or a time when you set aside for writing? Do you wait till the muse hits you? Uh, how, how does that work for you? Um, well, I think that I, when I first started writing, I really relied a lot on, um, like the muse coming in and, and, um, having inspiration in that way. But I think that as time has gone on, I, um, don't put as much pressure on myself, I guess. Um, and I do realize that there's so much importance in routine and in sort of cornering yourself so that you you will write. Um, so I, yeah, I think I do, I do try to write in the morning. Um, and I tried to write the, like a week ago in the evening and and that was kind of fun just because I, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not used to it. So it felt, I just felt different. Um, but yeah, I do, I do definitely have routines where I, um, I like to write in the morning. I like to try to meditate before and stretch and everything and just kind of like approach it with a clear mind. Um, but, but I also keep myself open all the time to, um, lines popping up or, ideas or textures and things that might start a poem. Um, so I'm, I'm always, I feel like I'm always trying to be like sensitive to that. Um, and, but a lot of times that will, that will be um, more of a moment where I'll write down a line or two and then I'll later come back and build a poem off of that line. So I, I think there is definitely a lot of work of, okay, you gotta sit down at your desk and you gotta um, be in a calm space and, um, kind of figure out, but but I think getting in that calm space is important to find a sort of distance from whatever subject I'm writing about and um, to kind of sift through it, so. Thank you. Uh, question for Krista Ragazzi. Krista, I'm too. Tell me how, tell us how you decided to um, choose that verse form to explore the theme of wallpaper and um, a little history about that poem. What motivated it for you? Did I unmute? Okay, and here I go. Sorry. Well, and I, um, I just think wallpaper is fascinating. And I have a friend that has the most beautiful wallpaper hung in her house. And um, 
it's not vintage, but many of the wallpapers that I have admired over the years um, do have characters and do have foliage and, you know, and animals. And it's just kind of interesting to me to know that they've been witness to so many things in so many people's homes that um, I just wanted to write about it. <laughs> and um, I love the format of the, you know, the, the two, four, six, eight, six, four, two syllable stances. So it was, you know, challenging, but yet it seemed to flow really well. So. That's how that happened. <laughs> so it was a real wallpaper in your world. Mm -hmm. Haven't we all had, haven't we all seen wallpaper that you're like, wow, that's been hanging in, you know, for years and it will have people and dresses or deer and rabbits and um, peacocks, just things just hanging on the walls. So. I thought it was an interesting subject. It is. Mark, Stucky, birds. And of all the many things that you do, sir, uh, what other um, topics have captured your imagination? Well, I, my day job is technical uh, communication. So uh, I deal a lot with technology and that can be um, very interesting to me. I started out in engineering long, long ago, but never finished a good degree in that. But I've kind of come full circle in that regard. Um, technology can be used for, for good or for evil, and I'm trying to put a spin of making it good. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for sharing. Uh, any other questions, comments? Oh, we have a question. Um, oh, oh, it's a comment. Um, Timothy has sent us several signed copies of Florentino and the Devil. If you purchase these, the proceeds will go to the Vicksburg Cultural Arts Center. You can go to the website to find out more information about how to make that purchase. We are very happy uh, about that donation. Thank you, Timothy. My pleasure. Okay. There's, there's a lot more in the book than we were able to do tonight. Oh, absolutely. Oh, That's I should say for you. Huh? Wonderful. Thank you so very much. Um, thank you, all of our poets and artists um, who participated not only in this evening, but in our tournament of writers, which we will do again in 2021. So um, if you haven't subscribed to the website or you don't check it out regularly, uh, don't miss all the things that are coming up at VicksburgArts.com because we've got a lot of things going on. And even though that is virtual for us, um, it is very much alive. Um, and it would be livelier still with your donation. I haven't been asked to pitch that, but I'm just a person who lives in this community. And um, I want all of us to do our part and help the CAC out. Um, you can follow us on Facebook and Instagram as well. So I hope you do that. Um, and, uh, and we would not even be here at all if it weren't for the generous sponsorship that we received that made this virtual evening possible. So we want to thank the Irving Gilmore Foundation, the Kalamazoo Community Foundation, the PNC Foundation, very grateful to the mill at Vicksburg for their financial support and Frederick Construction, the Art House, and the Main Street Pub. And uh, thanks to them, we not only had this evening together, but we've got activities um, going on on Sunday and um, are really excited about next Saturday, the um, 3rd of October as well, and all the things that are coming down after that. So. Um, I appreciate very much the opportunity to focus our thoughts and intentions on the arts and culture, not only here in our community, but larger than that. The opportunity that technology brings us, even though we can't be together personally, what a great night to spend in Venezuela with the wonderful people who shared with us their thoughts and, um, and the 
Yes, clapping is very appropriate. Again, you are more than yourself, and I am only the man trying to recognize myself in you. What an awesome line. And by man, I mean human. So thank you very, very much. Let us know by following us on Instagram and Facebook um, and on our website. Any thoughts and suggestions you have about the next things that you would be interested in tuning into. I guess that's it from the VCAC. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. That work. Thank you for inviting me, Timothy. That work. Janice in St. Petersburg. Thank you, Timothy. Yes. I enjoy.